was reminded as I was listening to you of um, um, a soiree I had like last week with a couple of young kids, 20-somethings, and at some point they were kind of showing off like, hey, I've done ecstasy, I've done this, I've done that, what about you? And it, it had me a little bit worried because they were talking about it like I would talk about flavors of ice cream. Mm -hmm. What I like about you and what you just said is that you're not promoting this. You're not necessarily promoting it, mm -hmm. or are you? Well, I mean, <laughs> look, I'm a big fan. Stay, uh, stay here. And there's, <laughs> you know, but we, we had a conversation about yeah. this yesterday, and I think if you look at our culture, something is... There is something that is lacking in our basic discipline around many areas. If you look at tobacco, it's a sacred yeah. plant from the Amazon and in native traditions. Coca is used by indigenous communities in Colombia to resolve conflict. They call it palabra dulce. It means like the sweet word and it increases your ability to talk and listen to each other. And we turn it into cocaine and it has the exact same opposite. We abuse our relationship to sex, we abuse our relationship to work, and I think we inherently have a lack of discipline in our uh, uh, culture. And I do think that there is a risk of this type of uh, dopamine-driven uh, um, uh, behavior to filter into the psychedelic space. So I'm a big fan, yes. but also, you know, it needs to be done with caution because it's not just about taking as much psychedelics as possible and all your problems will go away somehow. <laughs> does, it, does it need to be done, Dr. Professor Loras? Do we have to? Do we have to? You, you are free okay. to do okay. as you like, depending on your needs. I think there's a lot of exciting new research. I think it's important that there's all the history, of course, of psychedelics, and at one point it was banned. So it's also, for us scientists, impossible to do these studies, and that luckily has changed. I, I'm very happy to see these developments, and, and I think there's different, maybe if we talk about micro-dosing, to me this is just like taking medication. I mean, we're mm -hmm. um, passively swallowing something and hoping that things might change. If you have a trip, that's different because you need to do something with that. Um, but it's still an active process. So I, I strongly believe in the complementarity. So I'm a physician. I'm very happy we have these medicines and the high tech and it saves our lives. It improves our quality of life. And yet, I think we've been neglecting the role of each and every one of us. And, and very often it's like polarized. I believe in it, I'm, I'm, I, I, I promote this, or I'm, or, you know, I'm against. And I, I think the, the, the truth is in the middle, and, and we should try to give this a place. Uh, but it's work. It's not mm -hmm. just, I take it and for everyone, uh, the problems are solved. Yeah, and uh, we also had a conversation about down? this before. Are you okay standing? Do you yeah. want to sit down? No, Do you want to hug? I'm happy standing. Okay. We can <laughs> levitate. <No hugging>. <laughs> no, yeah. we, we had a conversation about this before, and I, I personally, I follow a tradition, the one that I got introduced there with ayahuasca, and it's, it's something that you, it becomes a spiritual practice, but in that practice, it's, many people consider that if you have an ayahuasca practice or in Santo Daima practice without meditation, it's an incomplete practice. And the way I like to see it is that, you know, if you see the spiritual journey as a mountain and the psychedelic experience can take you to the top of that mountain and all of a sudden you're like, <gasps> you can take a deep breath and you can see the horizon and you can hear the birds and you're, the clouds might be below you, you see the blue sky and you just feel like, wow, this is how I'm able to live. And then, typically, uh, people refer to this phase afterwards as the, um, as the afterglow, which is what I experienced with my wife. And, um, and this is really the window of opportunity. But if you don't change anything fundamental in your life, you will always revert to the mean. So you might get to the top of the mountain, but if you go back to the same pattern and the same context, you're going to revert back to you previous state of being, and it's only by starting to make practical changes in your life and introducing things like meditation, mindfulness, yoga, um, healthy exercise, healthy food, that you will start to see sustainable improvements in your quality of life. So it's definitely not a one-hit wonder, and it's definitely not 
you know, jump going up and down to the peak of the mountain is not a destination yeah. uh, to strive for, in my opinion. So basically, if you take it from a place of stability and you start exploring, yes for you, yes for you? Well, I, I think it's important to maybe emphasize if you have a medical issue, mm. you know, please talk about this mm. with your physician, mm. with a mm. professional healthcare provider. Um, and also, we work with psychologists who are using uh, psilocybin and psychedelics um, so that you're in good hands. I think yeah. that's one specific um, need. And then, of course, there's all the rest. What, for me, spirituality, I'm a scientist, so mm -hmm. what do I do with that? And yet, there's not just knowledge, right? I mean, there's also experience. There's what's the meaning of this all and yeah, finding. Exactly. Um, so that's the challenge, to bring those two worlds together. Because I like the gesture you made before. You did this, and I completely relate to that. It's, it's about finding meaning or something higher, or something bigger than yourself. Do meditation and psychedelics get you to the same light? I mean, I would like to see it as... I, I think the answer is yes. I do think that if you are consistently uh, implementing a... a, a psychedelic a meditation practice in your life you will eventually arrive to that place um, and but most importantly this is how you develop a sustainable healthy improvement in your life and 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 i think this is so so important the psychedelic is a window into what's possible it's a relief it's not a a destination mm -hmm. And it's a destination that can go wrong at times. I mean, things can go wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I work, um, apart from working with Amanda and the uh, and Beckley Foundation, I've been working with actually a Dutch, uh, a Belgian guy called Ben Delonen, who founded an exceptional organization called ICERS, which is based in Barcelona. And they've been running for 10 years something called the Ayahuasca Support Center. And basically, if you've been to the Amazon or anywhere, you had an uh, experience, a uh, psychedelic experience, and you struggle afterwards, you can just pick up the call, phone and call them, and they will help you and guide you through this process. And um, there is definitely um, uh, consequences. Uh, I mean, the first thing to say about psychedelic is that there is no lethal dose. It's non-toxic in that case. Uh, at least what I'm aware of. Maybe you have a different uh, opinion, but it's considered a safe substance. Well, no, I, I think it's, it, it can be dangerous, right? And it's yeah. also if, if you're young, we're all 18 plus here, I think, by default. Um, but so, to me, it's a, a neurochemical shortcut. Um, but there's many ways, I think, one can develop spirituality uh, and, and, and um, your experience is one and I think it's, it's inspiring and there's many other ways um, and I do think we should uh, discuss you know what as a physician are the possible indications contraindications risks and how can we guide and of course be aware that you know this can be very very profound and yeah. I myself was given psilocybin magic mushrooms um, in my veins, uh, in Hardcore. a controlled condition, in an MRI. I do not recommend that because I had the bad trip of my life. It was my first experience yeah. <laughs> in this big machine making a lot of noise. So I lost my, my ego, that can be good, but it was, it was fear and, and of course that's understandable. It was not, yeah. not the good yeah. um, conditions. Um, but so yes, I think it's important that we also discuss, you know, what are the risks here? Um, especially in young people. I have a question. What did you lose when you say I lost my ego? Well, you I being did a doctor, no longer exist. Very, very particular. So I'm, my passion is, is the mind. Do I, I brought something, which is a 3D print of my own brain. It's a bit uh, exhibitionist. And that I, is your keychain. Uh, luckily, I'm not a urologist. Huh? Oh, God. Uh, no. But this is, this is it, you know? <laughs> It's quite expensive, so I only have one hemisphere. Yeah. Okay. And, and so, yeah, well, what I saw when I got psilocybin in the MRI was the effect on my default mode, you know, the thinking, the me. So, so that was very profound, and then I could, of course, map it, uh, which is the part here colored uh, with my son in you blue. You saw that. So 
afterwards, I, oh, okay. I, I saw the results. So what is it to lose your, yourself? Mm -hmm. um, I was asked to stare at a cross, and that machine makes a lot of noise, and then suddenly, you know, everything became one. All my senses, what I heard and saw, and then I no longer existed, which was kind of interesting. And then there was also a nurse holding my hand, and I was so happy. Actually, this was captured on television, National Geographic. I look like a hero in the, in the documentary. I felt very, very small, because at one point, there was no longer a hand. So it was, it was a very intense experience. But there was one. Christian, there was yeah. one. Everything yeah. was connected. Yeah, I, right? mean, uh, th this, I mean, this <laughs> sense of oneness mm -hmm. is a, a big part of the psychedelic experience. And I think very connected to the coming two topics that are coming on this stage, which is our relationship to nature. And for me, when I had my first experience with ayahuasca, it was daytime, it was in the forest, and I was sitting there, and I'm from Sweden, and I spent a lot of time in nature, but it was a very material relationship with nature. It was like, you know, jumping and climbing and building and breaking and throwing rocks in the water, and, and it could have been a playground, it happened to be the forest, and then I was sitting there, and it was just like, wow, I'm back in nature, but it feels very different. And all of a sudden, I could really sense that every single tree and every single bush and everything you plant is a sentient being with, you know, spirit and, and, and connection. And I could feel the connectivity between these uh, beings. And, and we now have uh, scientifically validated studies that are showing this process of how plants and uh, trees are communicating through yeah. the root system, through the mycelium, mycelium. and um, you know how they have a sense of awareness, they can warn each other, they can support each other, and somehow these psychedelic experiences, because it takes us out of our minds into our bodies, it reduces this part of the brain that is the ego and the accumulated uh, uh, learnings of life, and all of a sudden you can connect into the bigger picture and realize that we are all connected. And then when you sit there and you realize like, wow, you feel this life force of nature and you realize that this is the life force that is within me and that's the life force that is within everyone. And, 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 if we, and everything we have comes from the natural world and we come from the natural world. And if we want to have a future to believe in, we need to be in service of this natural world. So I do think that there's a profound uh, connection between what's happening in you know, the world of psychedelics and plant medicines and, um, mm -hmm. and what's happening in the world of regeneration, uh, which is going to be covered in the next uh, two conversations. Exactly. <laughs> I, I really uh, agree that this reconnection with nature, mm -hmm. with ourselves, mm -hmm. um, the planet is very important. Actually, in Canada, I spent uh, a lot of the time there, I can prescribe nature therapy, a one-year entrance to one of the wonderful natural parks. And again, it's not... I see many people with, with brain damage. Um, and it's, it's, of course, not only um, being with the psychedelics. So actually, you can have these experiences without psychedelics in nature. Uh, and then together with, you know, depending on what you have, the medication, the surgery. Um, so we have a, a study ongoing now where we compare meditation, hypnosis, even cognitive trance in people who had cancer. Now, they have the classical treatment and complementary to that, those approaches. And I think you're absolutely right. Nature is wonderful. We see these butterflies, well done. But I hope we can still enjoy real butterflies, right? It's, it's not just the, 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 the technology and, and the virtual reality yeah. and the metaverse. I think the challenge now is really to take care of ourselves and the planet. I had asked for a microphone, but I lost the microphone. If anyone has a question, Please just raise your hand. There's a microphone on your way. Don't feel you have to, but there's space for you okay. to ask a question. There's a question there. While we wait for the mic to arrive, I just yeah. want to add one thing about bad trips. Because, you know, bad trips, a lot of people have heard about this thing about bad trips. And I just want to make one separation. In the psychedelic world, people talk about set and setting. Set is you, how you arrive into a psychedelic experience, and setting is the, the space that you arrive into, including the people that are facilitating. And, 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 um, and then, if you arrive 
unprepared in an environment like arriving to Amsterdam, have a few beers, take a bunch of truffles, and then wander around the streets with uh, bicyclists and cars and you know, everything that goes on in Amsterdam, you will be overwhelmed and you yeah. will experience a shock. Like being yeah. in an MRI machine, I cannot think of a more horrible environment to have a psychedelic experience. It's a wonderful environment for a scientist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then you also have what comes up, which can no, be <laughs> repressed trauma, feelings of anxiety, uh, feelings of fear. And this is not necessarily a bad trip. This mm. can be the healing in itself. But you need to also know where to take this afterwards. So if something comes up, it does, just because you have a difficult time doesn't mean that it's a bad trip. Actually, that is, could be exactly what you need, but then you need to have something that holds you Integrates. afterwards, which people yeah. refer to as integration, which is really about what do I do with this now? What do I do with this feeling of loneliness, this feeling of fear, this feeling of anxiety, or this revelation about a trauma that I had suppressed from my childhood? So these are two different concepts, and it's good to separate them. <laughs> Are you ready for your question? Do you feel yes, like standing up? And okay, uh, thank you, uh, first, both of, uh, both of the presenters. My question is actually maybe a bit complex. I'm very intrigued by uh, the knowledge you are sharing today, but it's still pretty niche, let's say, for a lot of people, a lot of elderly people, even, let's say, even youth doing uh, psychedelics is still um, seen as a bit dangerous for some people. So how can we bring this knowledge to the people? How can we make it acceptable, uh, acceptable to meditate, to, to do this? How can we talk about it? How can we just make it a common thing without yeah. being looked at? Because I think it's something very important for the future to start meditating in a more Absolutely. bigger world and everything is going fast. Absolutely, and I'm going to add something to that because I also teach meditation. Very often when you suggest to someone, you know, close your eyes, just soften your breath. You don't use difficult words or anything. It's very left field for a lot of people. It's very, like, oof, it's very intrusive. So how do you make it acceptable? How do you, well, how do you make it appealing to people? I, I think um, a lot of wonderful things are happening. So now, without talking about the psychedelics, um, when well. speaking about mental well-being, it's just so important. We can't ignore the fact um, that one in three, if you look left, you look right, one of those persons is going to suffer from a mental brain disease. So, so it's important. We cannot just you know, continue and, and work ourselves into burnout or sleeping problems, anxiety, depression. I see many young people also with suicide attempts. So it, it's, it's just a question of how is society um, going to change yeah. this? And I think it starts at school. Um, it's very strange. We all had um, the, the, the teacher um, giving us gymnastics, and it's part of the curriculum at school. Why can't we do the same thing for our mental well-being? We know there's something like emotional intelligence. We have many needs, especially the young people we saw with COVID, that are just being neglected. And meditation is just mental gymnastics. It's having people um, and giving you the tools um, to reconnect with your emotional needs, interacting with others, training, empathy, compassion. Um, and, and really, it's, it is happening. Um, it takes some time, but uh, I am very happy to contribute a little bit to that. As a scientist, yeah. as a physician, sometimes, you know, the Cartesian engineers say, oh, if he says it, then maybe. But it's not about believing. It's really backed up by science. Yeah, yeah. And you write amazing books about it, which helps. But you need to do it in the yeah, end. Yeah, you need to so give it a try. that personal but trajectory. There's, there's many, many ways to do it. Yes. There's a difference between sitting down, closing your eyes, and giving meditation a try for five minutes, or trying psilocybin mm -hmm. for the first time. You know, how do you make that an option for people without, without overwhelming them, or without pushing them, or without marginalizing them? Well, I, I think the first thing is that it doesn't have to be psychedelics. You can go for a Vipassana, you can have, yeah. in many ways, you can arrive this incredible breath work, which is just your breathing, and you can have incredible altered states of consciousness. And um, I think, um, you know, if, if, like my more, uh, I grew up and I was always angry that I didn't live in the 60s. I was like, wow, there was this amazing time in history and everyone looked amazing and it was so beautiful and full of love and hope and inspiration. And now I'm living in this 
yuppie age and it's just so uninspiring. It's wonderful. But that was when I was younger. And then now I'm looking at the time I'm living and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And I think what happened last time around was that there was this cultural war and there was this polarization. And we're seeing this polarization today as well. I think there's a few differences between then and now. I think what happened with the first psychedelic wave was that, you know, you had people coming from war with lots of post-traumatic stress, arriving into San Francisco and getting incredibly high doses of LSD. And it's just a horrible combination to have. Uh, uh, and, and a lot of weird things happened on the back of that and a lot of problematic things. So I think it was a shock to the public. What you see today, like the average doses, even in the recreational arena, is much, much lower. And thanks to indigenous traditions and plant medicines, we have been given tools to hold these spaces and to prepare. When you engage with these cultures that have centuries of experience working with psychedelic uh, substances, uh, actually the f emphasis on the substance itself is not that big. It has a lot to do with silence and meditation and fasting and presence and being in nature and about creating sacred spaces for ourselves and each other. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it, we have this obsession of like, wow, we found this one thing, now let's make it all about that. Um, and we, I think this time, it's a much more balanced movement and we have much better tools. We have you know, an awareness of yoga, we have an awareness mm -hmm. of meditation. Which and I think we're it. also starting to reach a point where it's unavoidable to, to see what's going on in the world and that there is something that is fundamentally misaligned with the way that we are living and the way that our societies are structured. So, I'm, but, and the last part, which I think, because I was early into cannabis and I was early into psychedelics, so I've been following these movements, and what I'm so happy to see is that both the cannabis movement and the psychedelics movement, in the US in particular, have managed to become what's called big tent movements, that cross the spectrum from from uh, Republicans to Democrats. And uh, the reason why they have managed to become that is because it's been leading with science and it's been really proving. And once you have someone that you love that suffers and they are relieved from this suffering, all this cultural stigma goes away and you're just grateful that the people you love are not suffering anymore. Mm -hmm. And when you start from that point, there is you know, common ground to build around. So mm -hmm. this is happening in the cannabis space, it's happening in the psychedelic space, and I really, really hope that it will happen also in the regenerative space with yeah. the promotion of organic, regenerative, small-scale, diversified agriculture, that that doesn't become one of these polarized topics. Yeah. Um, but I think it, it, it is happening, and I don't think it's going to crash this time, but I think we also need to be a little bit patient. And, and, and you know, when I started with the psychedelics, I was like, telling everyone, and my brother, I was like, blah, blah, blah. and he was like, yeah, 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 he went in here, out there, he's like, Christian, I'm very happy for you, but this yeah. is not my yeah. thing. Yeah. But then our mother passed away, and after the process, he sat down to me and said, okay, Christian, tell me about the psychedelics. Not because anything I said to him, but he saw something in me, how I carried myself in that process that he liked, and then he asked, and I think this is also something we need to be a little bit patient and not try to promote and sell what works for us to others. Just focus yeah. on yourself, focus on your healing journey, and wait for people to ask, and then you answer. Yeah. <laughs> and that is the natural way of, of, of building a sustainable movement rather than just broadcasting yeah. it all over. Yeah, maybe creating space for that creativity to, yeah. to be able to land somewhere. Something like that. <laughs> Another question? I'm looking around, do we have time for more? Because we could go on forever and ever. There's another question. Where's the mic? There's a microphone. That is a familiar face, if ever I knew one. Hello. Zora, please stand up. Oh, May everyone look at Hello. how beautiful you are today. Well, <laughs> I have a you. question. I just released a track that I made in 528 hertz, uh -huh. the frequency of love. I read a study about it that it would restore uh, damage to DNA. And for the people who don't know, most of the music is produced in 440 hertz. But it actually 
started at 432, like Mozart composed it. And as uh, regarding to meditations, you can find a lot of YouTube videos yeah. in those frequencies to restore, to, to, to have a better sleep, to, to meditate, to concentrate. So it's a question for you, Laurel. What about frequencies and music? Because we are at the music festival. Yeah. And for you, I'm pro microdosing. <laughs> <laughs> so, frequencies, microdosing, go. So more important than anything is, is your motivation. I think um, music can help. Um, it's, it's very good to have that science looking at how the brain reacts to those different frequencies. But again, we shouldn't see this, oh, I'm going to put on this or that sound, and then everything is going to happen for me. So I very much believe in, in motivation. Um, and then we can create the right circumstances um, it can be with, I think nature is terribly important. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, extremely agree. important to emphasize. Um, and also connecting to the previous question, how we can do this, I mentioned schools, but I think it's also the working environment. We spend a lot of time at work, most of us, uh, and so I'm very happy that there's also raising awareness and I give keynotes to um, those CEOs and those people are becoming more aware that it's truly win-win. Um, and so meditation again and all the other uh, healthy lifestyle uh, habits can help us. So happy and I will check out your soundtrack. Maybe you could send him a copy. Yeah, microdosing. <laughs> Uh, microdosing, ju just one point on frequency. I think it's uh, really, you can feel it. If you have a well-held ceremony of ayahuasca or any plant medicine, you know, music is always an essential part of it and harmonizing ourselves with our voices and with instruments. And when you come out, I can, you can feel this reset, this harmony. It's like a different frequency. And and when you think about it, when, when you shout and you scream, you start shaking. And when you drink too much alcohol, you start shaking. And everything is ultimately about vibrations and frequencies. Uh, so greater awareness around frequency and is, is, is essential. And you know, every, every word that you say, even every thought has a frequency and carries an energy. And, 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 and to be very aware about this is, is great. And microdosing. I mean, I live on Ibiza, and when the, when the microdosing started, it became very popular very quickly, and it became this running gag. It was like that was not a microdose, and that's yeah. I think the danger with microdosing that is very tempting. A microdosing is supposed to be subperceptual, but for people who like psychedelics, it's very hard to keep it subperceptual. And if you're constantly walking around life and kind of tripping it can be a little bit disorientating. So, <laughs> you know, the, 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 there is some risks around microdosing that doesn't exist with the large trip experience. Um, uh, but there is also undoubtedly, you know, a vast body of anecdotal evidence of the benefits of microdosing. And, um, and the research is coming on this. And I think especially interesting areas is, is like elderly care, for example, kind of like lifting your spirit and so on um, in that moment in life. Um, but yeah, I like microdosing too. <laughs> of course you do. I have a feeling that another track is starting, that another theme is starting. So maybe this would be a nice moment to, yeah. to thank all of you. If you're interested, by the way, in frequencies, come back for Dr. Zach Bush. He's all about frequencies. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for cuddling. Thank you so much for paying attention. Thank you for your openness. Thank you so much. Kristen Jochnik, amazing. Thank you for coming all the way from Ibiza via Paris. He was confused. He thought it was in Paris. Thank you very much, Dr. Steve Laudas. Thank you very much. Bye.